So my, again, my name is Vasily. I'm working in Yandex. Uh, just for your information, Yandex is a Russian IT company. Uh, okay. Uh, I think, uh, so uh, Yandex is a Russian IT company, and uh, it's not just some IT company in Russia. It's uh, today one of the biggest IT company in Russia, and it's uh, the biggest uh, search engine in the world. And uh, we are quite successful because uh, we have used for many years, machine learning techniques to solve our production problems. Especially, we have quite big experience with gradient boosting. And uh, two years ago, we've released an open source CatBoost. I am the main developer of GPU version of CatBoost. And today, I will talk about what this library is about, uh, how we work with categorical and text data, uh, and uh, we provi will provide you some <coughs> overview. So, here on the slide, a very brief structure of my talk. Firstly, I will explain for everyone what gradient boosting is about. Uh, maybe someone d does not know. Uh, then I will uh, explain how we deal with categorical and text data uh, in an automatic way. It's, our, it's something that you will not find in other boosting libraries like XGBoost or LightGBM. And finally, I will give you a brief overview of functionality, what performance you can expect, what uh, features we have, and so on. So, let's start our talk today. Uh, and I want to start by explaining what is boosting about. Gradient boosting is a technique, as well as CatBoost is the implementation of the technique, that's designed to solve supervised learning problems. Here on the slide, you can see a very rough illustration of what supervised learning uh, consists of in applied problems. Firstly, we have some applications, like medicine, finance, or search engine, and so on. Uh, for this application, we have some data at hand. This data could be, uh, well, for example, music, images. It could be something classic like uh, uh, numerical data and so on. And with this data at hand, we want to solve our problem. For this, we have some tools like linear models, neural networks, and so on. Uh, data at hand is usually just number of samples, and for each sample, we have some label we need to predict this label based on the sample alone. And uh, for different applications, uh, uh, we have to predict uh, this label in some optimal way. Uh, this optimal way is usually specified by application we have. For example, sometimes you want to solve classification problem, and this optimal way, for example, could be we need to optimize AUC metric or logarithmic loss or cross entropy or something like this. Or we need to solve regression problem, so this is mean square error. And usually different type of tools like linear models, like decision tree, could be easily used for different type of problems. Just select the proper loss function and that's it. But for different type of input data, we need to use different type of tools. For example, uh, I think everyone knows that today, if you need to make a classifier for images, you definitely should use convolutional neural networks. And for example, for audio, for speech recognition, it's uh, probably convolutional neural networks or some recurrent neural networks. And here on the slide, uh, one way to classify the data we have today in our applied problems. Firstly, we have so-called unstructured data. It's raw data like music images. And this is place where you need to use neural networks. They will provide you the state of the art result. But there is one more type of input data that we use in practice. It's a classical type of data, it's tabular data. Uh, usually we present this data as a matrix, where each row of this matrix is a sample, and each column is a feature or a predictor that was designed by people using their own mind, and maybe some neural networks or automatic techniques uh, in such a way that this feature will provide us some information about the problem we solve, which will help us to predict the label. And for such type of uh, input data, uh, state-of-the-art results are achieved not by deep learning, no neural networks. Uh, here we have uh, gradient boosting on decision trees technique. Uh, this technique achieves st state-of-the-art results, and basically uh, uh, do this technique builds very simple model. It's a linear combination of uh, decision trees. You start just training one decision tree, then iteratively, in a greedy manner, we train one more tree in such a way that this tree will correct the errors of previous ones. There is math uh, for everyone who is interested, but uh, I wa don't want to spend time on this. Uh, we, I want to cover more 
high level aspects of everything. So look for literature for more details if you don't know about gradient boosting. Uh, what's important that gradient boosting uh, have several nice properties. Firstly, this technique could work well for very small data sets, uh, unlike, for example, neural networks. If you have 1,000 samples, 10,000 samples, no problem, gradient boosting will work. And at the same time, this technique could be scaled for very big data sets. For example, in Yandex, we are training gradient boosting on several, uh, almost on terabytes of data. And secondly, uh, this technique is very easy to use. Uh, in gradient boosting, there are almost, I think, three parameters that uh, need to be carefully tuned. It's uh, depth of each decision tree in our model, it's number of decision trees, and it's uh, learning rate. Just these three parameters, and almost all other effort you could spend on working with data. This will give you more benefits than uh, dealing with the model. Unlike, for example, uh, neural networks where you can spend months or years searching for a good architecture. But uh, it's when you solve practical problems, not when you want to win Kaggle competition, for example. On Kaggle competition, uh, you need to tune everything, but it's not a real world, it's more like a competition. So when no competitions, spend time working with data, not try to uh, work with your model, at least uh, for 90% of time, I think. Okay. Uh, so, this technique is uh, quite popular, and uh, for example, uh, all, all almost all Kaggle competitions uh, are won by some type of boosting library, and today we have several efficient implementations of this technique. It's XGBoost, it's uh, CatBoost, and it's LightGBM. Uh, no, I will talk definitely about CatBoost. Uh, I will not talk about XGBoost or LightGBM, uh, but uh, I think uh, all these three libraries are very great open source contributions and provide all data scientists a lot to deal with, uh, a lot of possibility to solve their problems. Uh, and CatBoost is a gradient boosted decision tree library that was uh, sold, uh, developed uh, from our expertise uh, using gradient boosting in our practical tasks. Uh, we've been using gradient boosting for years. For example, in 2012, we've already have GPU version. Uh, for in 2012, there was no deep learning, there were no XGBoost, uh, but we've already trained uh, models on GPU. Uh, and two years ago, we've released in open source our latest version of gradient boosting. It's CatBoost, uh, now we're quite popular. We already have 4,000 4, stars. Uh, and one thing that we have and all other libraries does, does not provide you is uh, ability to work with non-numerical data, like categorical and uh, now it's also text data. Uh, and in next, the next couple of slides, I will explain uh, the basic idea how to deal with non-numerical data combined with boosting. It, it could be used with other boosting libraries as well, but for CatBoost we have tightly integrated this idea and uh, gradient boosting algorithm, so it provides slightly better results. So, let's start. Firstly, uh, several words about uh, decision trees. Uh, gradient boosting is a very powerful technique, but this technique has one limitation. Uh, input features, input data should be efficiently handled by decision tree. By, by efficiently handled, I mean that we should be able to learn decision tree, and then this decision tree should generalize well, so we could use it on some dependent validation set and have good metric, or otherwise uh, this model will just overfit all it. Very well known empirical fact is that decision tree work best with uh, numerical features that have some natural order relation. For example, year, rating, and so on, when we could take two values and compare them. For other type of data, there are some approaches that allows us to train decision trees, but they are not used widely because they won't provide you very good results. Because of this, uh, before, uh, uh, in boosting, uh, we have something like you can see here on the slide. It's basic pipeline how we solve practical problems with gradient boosting. Firstly, we have data. This could be text data, music data, something, uh, some logs from your service, and so on. And based on this data, 
we perform feature extraction and feature engineering. Uh, one part of this feature extraction and feature engineering could be learning deep learning model. So I today talk about boosting. You should not think that boosting and deep learning are competitors, nothing at all. You could efficiently combine them. The only thing is uh, you should firstly preprocess your data, convert it to matrix uh, with numerical features, uh, with features with no order, some order relation, and then you could train gradient boosting and ship model for production, for example. And here, the most time-consuming step is feature extraction and feature engineering. Uh, if you closely look at uh, this step, uh, th then you can see that uh, there are two types of features that are usually developed. Some are uh, features that are domain-specific. For example, it could be some feature that is specially developed for search engine. For example, page rank from Google. Uh, or it could be some feature for medicine, and so on. And these uh, features can be computed automatically for different type of problems. But there is some other type of features that are basically, let's take some data, perform some automatic uh, algorithm, and take, we will have some number that could be efficiently used in boosting. And this feature will not uh, require you some domain-specific knowledge. Interestingly, uh, for some type of data, we could make automatic feature engineering based on State, some state-of-the-art approaches that are used, for example, on Kaggle. And in CutBoost, we've implemented special techniques to deal with categorical data and with text data. Uh, and I will start by explaining how we deal with categorical data. Uh, so categorical features, uh, features that are not directly comparable with each other. For example, it could be hashtags, music genre, and so on. And uh, uh, for such type of features, uh, it's very well known that there is this, this technique called one-hot encodings that could be used. And it's technique very simple. We just, for each category, introduce one new column. We set the value to one if, we, if this categorical feature is equal to category from this column or there otherwise. But this technique has big uh, limitations. Uh, this technique uh, can't work with features with big cardinality. Uh, for example, with hashtags, or uh, there is a categorical feature user ID, and we have millions of user IDs. What's more, sometimes we train model, then uh, there is a new user, and we need to retrain everything from scratch. One hot encoding will not work in such scenario. But still, CutBoost could do it automatically. But to deal with uh, uh, categorical features with high cardinality, we need something uh, more specific for high cardinality features. And it turns out that uh, we could compute special statistics based on category, and this statistic could be very powerful features. In CutBoost, we have two types of statistics. Firstly, we could compute statistics based just on category itself. Here on the slide, an example, uh, I have categorical feature genre. Uh, and basically, a statistic based on category is probability that this category, that we will see this category in our data. So we have some category like blues, we compute number of sample with blues label and use this instead of blues. This is numerical feature, has natural order relation, and turns out could be quite good. But it's not the most efficient way to deal with uh, categorical data because such type of features will not use information about problem we are solving. We have labels, and uh, uh, it's very desirable to incorporate this information in uh, our model, in our working. And uh, there is a special technique called label encoding sometimes uh, that allows to efficiently combine categorical features uh, and uh, information from categorical data and uh, or from label and make one numerical feature from this. This, te this technique is simpler to explain for classification tasks. For, so for the rest of my talk, I will assume that we are solving classification problem. But uh, uh, for regression for rank, it still could be generalized. Uh, and for, for classification problem, leg label encoding simply takes a category. For this category, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have some true success rate that uh, our label will be equal to one. Uh, it's just some probability. We just we don't know it, but if we we will know it, then we could use it as a numerical feature, and it 
would be a very powerful predictor. But we can't know it, at least while we have a finite amount of data. So like in any statistical task, we just make some estimator of this statistic. Uh, we could use maximum likelihood estimator, uh, but this estimator has limitations. Uh, for example, here on the slide, uh, again, categorical feature genre. And very often for each category, we have just several observations. Uh, like for example, here for blues, I ha have just one thumb up, it's a label one and nothing else. If we will use maximum likelihood estimator, then we will predict one for each sample. It looks like a bad feature. Uh, there is another type of estimators, Bayesian ones, uh, and they could be quite good, especially if we could find a good prior. Uh, but still, there will be one big conceptual problem. Uh, when we have our data, we usually wo want to make we want to make a label encoding on this data, and then we want to train very powerful technique, gradient boosting, on the same data set, using the same labels. When we perform label encoding, so we replace category with some estimator of probability, we basically take label and turn it in our features. No way that uh, we will not overfit. Uh, uh, there is one solution. Uh, we could just split the data, take one part of data to perform label encoding, the second part of data to train our model. But we will lose the data, it's not good. And there exists uh, one trick that allows to train, uh, to perform label encoding and to train gradient boosting on the same data and avoid this target leakage, so we will not overfit. Uh, basic idea is here on the slide. Uh, let's assume that for each sample we have some timestamp. Uh, it could be a real timestamp from real data, uh, or it could be just some random variable. Uh, after we have this timestamp, we could sort all our observations uh, by this timestamp, and then let's assume we want to perform label encoding for sample at time t. At this time, uh, we will, will not use all our data to perform estimation, but we will use samples from time zero to time t minus one. For example, here we have, uh, I think, uh, time three, there is dust, so uh, we need to perform label encoding for this uh, category, and we will use samples from zero to two, and count number of thumbs up and thumbs down, this category in general, and use only this data to perform uh, estimation of success rate. It could be shown that theoretically, and uh, th this will avoid target leakage, and it proved to be work very well in practice. Okay. Oh, finally, one last thing about categorical data and cat boost. Uh, statistics that I've described from previous slides definitely could be computed not only for a single feature, but we could also compute them for combination of features as well. For example, let's assume we need to predict if the user will like a song he listens or not, and we have features. We have feature genre, and we have a user ID. Combinations of these two features could be very strong predictor for the task, while just simple genre will not. Uh, uh, so we want to use feature combinations in our model, but uh, one problem. Uh, we don't want to have domain knowledge. We don't know which feature combinations are important. We need to perform this automatically, and number of different feature combinations is exponentially big. Uh, so we can't pre-compute them all in preprocessing stage. In CatBoost, uh, we have special algorithm. Uh, it's a greedy algorithm that search for these feature combinations on the fly during decision tree learning. Uh, it's computationally quite expensive because of this, CatBoost could sometimes works very slow on data with big number of categorical features, but it turns out that this approach to search for feature combinations uh, could be very efficient on publicly available to sets with categorical features. When we released CatBoost in open source, we make a comparison of our library and other boosting libraries on the sets with categorical features uh, for classification problem, and here on the slide are results. Compared to logarithmic loss, it's uh, one that each library was optimizing. And as you can see, CatBoost uh, outperformed all other libraries in terms of quality. Okay, so 
this uh, uh, is all about categorical data. If you want something more, I will uh, give you links about it uh, uh, after my talk. Uh, now let's talk about text data. Uh, this autumn we released uh, initial support for text data in CatBoost. And idea to deal with text is essentially the same one we used for categorical features. Again, we have uh, some data as input. Now this data is text. Uh, and we need to convert this text to a numerical feature in some automatic way. Uh, how we could do it? First, we could use a well-known technique, back of words. Uh, let's just, for each word in a sum dictionary, make a column and set it to one if this word was text and zero otherwise. Uh, very simple technique, very powerful, but if he, this technique will be done carefully. And Cadboost do it automatically. And this technique, again, has the same limitations that you will see when you do one hot encodings, because number of words is very big. Sometimes uh, you can't just learn uh, ensemble of decision tree uh, on features from back of words. But still, uh, if you will work with this technique carefully, it could prove well. Secondly, we could use something like we do, we've used uh, for categorical features with label encoded. Uh, label encoded basically says that we have some categorical feature. For, this, uh, categor for each category, we perform some classifier. For categorical feature, this is very simple classifier. We just uh, use constant as our decision. For text data, we can't use uh, label encoding because each text is unique, but we could try to use some light text classifier based on this text. Uh, and uh, then if this classifier will be fast enough that we could uh, learn it in online manner, like we uh, used uh, the trick with time for categorical features, then we could train this classifier on our data in online manner, uh, make uh, probability predict probabilistic predictions of a label for each text uh, and use these probabilities as inputs for our gradient boosting and uh, train on the same data, gradient boosting on decision tree without any target leakage. Uh, in CatBoost we have support for different type classifiers, uh, but uh, the most, and we experimented with several types, uh, uh, but uh, for now we decided to use basically a naive Bayesian classifier because it's uh, quite simple. It could uh, we compute it in one pass through the data and it provides you pretty good results. So, this uh, functionality is, uh, it was uh, released, uh, I think, uh, one month ago. Uh, we are still working on more things like, uh, for example, uh, uh, making linear regression as classifier uh, or something else. And uh, we are working on adding ability to work with embeddings from neural networks uh, with, with the same idea. It's even, uh, we have it in our code base, but we just don't have interfaces for Python still. But uh, you can already use it, but with one limitation. Sadly, but uh, this technique uh, for now is available only on GPU version of our library. For CPU version, we will add it, uh, I think, in a couple of months. Okay. So. Uh, I think that's it about uh, dealing with data. And now, the last part of my talk will be about brief overview of our library, what features we have, uh, what performance we can expect, and so on. And firstly, uh, th this technique about data that I've talked about, this uh, techniques that, for the best of my knowledge, are available only in CatBoost. So if you need them, you, you will need to try CatBoost. But if you still, you don't need them, you can still use CatBoost because it's a classical gradient boosting that could efficiently deal with categorical or with numerical features as well. We have too many features to describe them all. Uh, here on the slide, just some examples. Uh, I, I think I don't need to say that, but it's uh, it could be installed very easily, like any good boosting library. Just type pipe install and everything will work. Uh, we know that we are not the only boosting library in the world, that someone uh, some could be familiar with LightGBM, someone could be familiar with XGBoost, so we provide you synonyms for their parameters, uh, so if you need to switch, it will be pretty easy. 
we, we care about data, about uh, data preprocessing. Uh, we are trying to optimize everything we could. So if you have, for example, missing values, it's not a problem. We will form, uh, we will ha deal with them automatically. The next thing, uh, in CatBoost we have uh, many different objectives. So if you need to solve classification problem, ranking problem, regression problem, uh, for example, Poisson regression or mean absolute regression, uh, except, uh, and definitely least square regression, uh, we have loss function that work out of box and you don't need to implement them. Uh, the next thing, uh, when you deal with GDN boosting, uh, you usually want to compute metrics and track metrics during training. Uh, and you want to do it on some independent validation set. Usually we train model with some important metric like AOC, we look at this metric on validation set. When our model starts overfitting, we just uh, stop our training and shrink model to this situation. In CatBoost, we've implemented many different metrics for classification, for regression, for ranking, and could compute them automatically during training and export them in Jupyter, for example, or in TensorBoard. Uh, and one more thing, uh, we could compute this metrics not only on a CPU, if you are training on GPU, uh, then uh, we could compute them on GPU as well. For example, AUC metric is very expensive and if you can't compute them on GPU, when you train it on GPU, you will spend all your time computing metric instead of learning. Uh, one next useful feature is uh, a fitting detector. Uh, we could compute this metrics and also we could automatically decide that uh, you start overfitting, uh, that you don't need to train more, so uh, we will stop automatically and uh, uh, you do, don't need to set uh, iterations for very big number and look at plots to not waste your computation resource. Okay, now uh, the next thing is uh, model analysis. Uh, any machine learning model should be analyzed. We need to understand why features, uh, why and what features are important, uh, what samples are important, and uh, why model makes prediction. Uh, in CatBoost, we implemented a very powerful analytical toolkit. Uh, we have some classic types of feature importance measures. Uh, one you could find, for example, in uh, elements of statistical learning. Uh, we have some feature importance measures that are designed for ranking tasks. Uh, classic approaches will not work for them. And also we've implemented uh, several techniques that were proposed on recent machine learning conferences, uh, on top machine learning conferences, like NEOR IPS 2017, there are shape values. It's a uh, feature uh, importance measure that could be computed for each sample. Uh, we have some document we could uh, compute for in theoretically optimal way the importance of each feature for this document. Uh, we have support for influential samples from ICML 2018 paper, and this allows you to find what uh, observations are important for uh, your model, what influence model predictions. And finally, we have a Monoforest toolkit. It's a new paper uh, that will be published in Neo Rips 2019 uh, that gives one more new way to look at decision trees. Okay. Now, the last part of my talk it will be about performance. Uh, we have some functionality, but if you will need one year for training your model, I think you will not use library at all because time is important. And uh, uh, CatBoost is a highly efficient uh, library. We have a highly optimized uh, CPU version, uh, and here is a proof. We compared our CPU version with our competitors. Uh, with LightBM, with ExaBoost, and as you can see, uh, CatBoost uh, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but there is, there is no big difference. Uh, we can say that they are comparable, that you could use any of this library to solve your problem. There will be no, not one month, we see one year, for example. But this our CPU version, uh, and one moment, I, uh, there is rather data sets uh, with something like million samples, uh, uh, 11 million samples, uh, 
for someone, uh, you can think that these are big data sets. Uh, from my perspective, these are very small data sets that could be handled by this machine, for example. Uh, and uh, in practice, uh, we need to deal with much bigger data, uh, at least sometimes. And for very big data sets, uh, we don't want to use CPUs. Uh, we have very powerful GPUs today, like uh, NVIDIA uh, V100 or Titan V, uh, that provides you very great benefits compared to CPU. For example, here on the slide, we have a chart, and we computed relative speed up of uh, our GPU version compared to our CPU version. And we've used uh, several modern GPUs compared to 56 logical CPU. As you can see, uh, the more data we have, the more benefits we will have from GPUs. And when you need to train on several millions of samples with uh, several hundreds of features, uh, uh, NVIDIA Titan V could be, or NVIDIA V100 could be almost 40 times faster than pretty powerful CPU. Uh, and it's uh, true for our GPU version, and our GPU version not only faster than our CPU version, but it also will be faster than our competitors. Uh, we have Ledge BM and uh, XGBoost also have GPU versions, uh, but as you can see from the slide, on the same data sets, Card Booster always faster. Okay, the last thing about performance, uh, I, it was about training time, but uh, after we train, we want to use this model to predict for some of our users, and uh, prediction times for some applications matter. Uh, in CatBoost, we have uh, C++ implementation of inference uh, with SSE optimizations, and what's more, in CatBoost, we have special type of decision trees. I don't want to talk in details about that, but this type of decision trees allows us to um, make inference significantly faster than classical type of decision trees, uh, and at the same time have the same quality. As a result, CatBoost uh, could perform uh, predictions on CPU I think uh, 50 times faster than uh, XGBoost or LightGBM. Uh, it d will depend uh, on data set and number of trees, but 20 to 50 times faster, I think you will obtain. And if this is not enough, uh, we have a GPU inference uh, that will be even faster. Okay, so wrapping up, uh, today I've talked about CatBoost. It's a gradient boosting decision tree library. We have state-of-the-art approach to deal with categorical features. Uh, we could work with text, but you will need GPU for today. Uh, we have high-performance implementation on CPU, on GPU, and we could um, solve uh, latency-critical tasks when you need predictions. Uh, and finally, we have a uh, very easy-to-use analytical and visualization toolkit. Uh, if you interested, you want more information, firstly, you could read our papers. There's uh, more about math. Uh, it's in chronological order. Uh, secondly, uh, if you want to know more about boosting, just look at Wikipedia, for example, or in some classical book with boosting. And if you want to know how to use our library, uh, how to use it from Python, uh, you could uh, for our website, we have documentation or uh, in our GitHub. Thank you for your attention. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I think someone should give microphone. Yes. Thank you. Questions. Um, so on the nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so for the vectorization of text, uh, you yes. mentioned using uh, naive base. Yes. Right? I wasn't clear. I mean, naive base would give you one uh, result, right? It's one class, right? Yes. Or one data point, basically, per document. Uh, How do you actually create a vector from it? Uh, if you solve binary classification, that's not a problem. I'm sorry? Uh, naive Bayesian is, we could use naive Bayesian for binary classification problem. We just need one probability that cl the class will be equal to one, and this is a feature. Okay, so when we deal with multi-classification, there will be a, uh, uh, 
if you have car classes, there will be car minus one uh, probabilities, uh, but it could be easily generalized for multi-classification. Okay. And okay. indeed, this can be easily generalized for regression problem, but uh, it's uh, we are designed to deal with classification. Okay, got it. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can you use a document embedding as a feature? Uh, uh, firstly, uh, first thing, uh, embeddings from neural networks is uh, are very basic features for gradient boosting, uh, uh, but something like cosinus similarity, for example, between uh, document embedding and in case of search engine query embedding could be a very powerful feature, and we are using it internally, but uh, we have plans to add it to CatBoost uh, there is some code in our code base for dealing with embeddings already, but as I said, we don't have interfaces uh, to Python, and uh, I think we will add them in near future. Um, so you have a slide with uh, for the model performance in terms of uh, prediction power. Uh, quality. So um, I just want to see the how by using the cap boost. <laughs> Cap boost algorithm is better outperformed than using other prediction algorithms. I just want to see the comparison chart of the performance of the prediction, not about the time. I understand the time in terms of time, no, though very do efficient. You want something like this? Um, about so, is quality? it the prediction power it's algorithm? About logarithmic loss on uh, several data sets. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Uh, and for numerical data, uh, we will be comparable because, for example, for GPU version, we have uh, our own type of decision trees, plus we have uh, support to train almost likely uh, models very similar to ones from LightGBM or from XGBoost. Right, uh, let's thank uh, Vashili once more. And thank you again. <laughs>